I'm thrilled. Okay, well, we are Sarah Clark and Oh, Dale Wheeler from Cows County Master Gardeners from WSU County Extension. And this is planning your seed starting schedule. So um, we do have a disclaimer, <clears throat> which is there's no way we can tell you when to plant everything for all situations. But what we can do is give you access to information. And so if you look in the chat, we have the uh, Couts County web, uh, website here, and we'll click to this. It is uh, Couts County, CoutsCoMG.com. And when you get there, as you saw before, we can have a section called Learn With Us. And when you open it, you get all these lovely options. And we, this particular slideshow happens to be located in the vegetable gardening area. So the most important thing from the entire presentation is put this down somewhere where you can get to it so that you can. And it's in the chat box. And it's in the chat box. You can just copy and paste it. Uh, so you can get to the slideshow and all the references in it and other information. Uh, and now hopefully you won't just suddenly quit watching because you have everything you need. All right, so let's get going. Uh, go ahead, Dale. All so, right, so in today's presentation, we're gonna be talking about when you should plant your seeds. And next week, uh, Alice uh, Slusher is gonna be talking about how to plant your seeds. So today is just our schedule, our calendar. Uh, and if you're so interested, then join the group again next week uh, for determining then how to do this. So it's only calendar today. We're gonna be covering growing zones, uh, seed and seed packets and how to read them, direct planting or transplants, succession planting, extending the growing season. We're gonna give you some specific examples uh, about when to plant your seeds, winter gardening, and then finally a summary. So many of you are likely familiar with this USDA plant hardiness zone map, and we'll see that in Eastern Washington, uh, it's mainly in zone six, and here west of the Cascades uh, is in zone eight. And zone eight, for those of us here in Collitz County, uh, is the same hardiness zone as Northern Florida, but we don't grow the same plants in the summertime uh, and, and don't have the same thing in Northern Florida. So we need a second map uh, to look at. So here, this one is probably less familiar with to you, American Horticultural Society heat zone map. And this is for growing uh, uh, plants in the summer. And it's a map of how many days on average are above 86 degrees Fahrenheit. And you'll see in Eastern Washington, this is typically zones six and five. Uh, I saw someone was there from uh, online today from Spokane. So you'll see that's in zone five. Typically you'll have uh, about 35 to 40 days above 86. But here in College County, zone four, uh, which is many fewer days above 86, and those of us who live at higher elevation, probably even closer to zone three. You'll notice Northern Florida, uh, which was on the other map, is in zone nine for the heat zone map. They have 135 days a year on average above 86 degrees. And plants love heat to grow. Well, we have to take this into consideration when you're planning when to plant your plants, right? When to do your transplanting, when to do your direct seeding. So we need both of these maps to make those decisions. Our first map then really tells you about perennials, trees, shrubs, and other perennials. Will they survive the winter? Because it's about cold hardiness. The bottom map is used then, uh, will your vegetables and your annuals grow well in the summer? And how many days do you actually have uh, to plan for growing for those? All right, I think the number one thing that everyone should always know is what is your soil temperature? Because it is your soil temperature which dictates when germination will occur with your seeds and how fast your plants will actually grow. So 
you can use a thermometer like this. This one you can use for your compost pile as well as for your soil. Uh, today, I know that my soil out in my garden is at 41 degrees. It's still pretty cold, uh, but I do keep track of where soil temperature currently is uh, for that. Sarah gave you a disclaimer, but I'm going to say it again. Uh, every garden is unique. And I would say even within your own property that you're gonna have different locations on your property that are unique, different soil types and fertility. We live in different uh, areas of the state and, and region that have different amounts of rainfall. You might have a sunny part of your yard and one that's a lot more shady. And today we're gonna focus on temperature and mainly temperature of your soil. And again, even within our county, people are gonna have different soil temperatures at different times. A lot of information on this chart. I apologize for it. I'm gonna do some summary. This is um, minimum soil temperatures for germination. So uh, you'll notice that lettuce, onion, parsnip, and spinach uh, will germinate once your soil temperature is at 35 degrees but the optimum temperature for germination and for, and for plant growth is much warmer than that, closer to 70 degrees. So just because your seeds will germinate doesn't necessarily mean that they will grow well, but this is the minimum temperature for germination. Beets, carrots, peas, et cetera, require a soil temperature of 40 degrees before germination will occur. So you need to keep track. But again, your plants really won't grow well just because the seeds germinate. Corn and tomatoes, uh, 50 degrees if you're direct planting seeds uh, before they will germinate. So keep track of uh, what that minimum is. And then for our uh, summer direct seeding of our crops, you can see that the minimum soil temperature for germination is all the way up to 60 degrees. So things like peppers and squash, uh, you probably want to do. Uh, uh, transplant versus direct planting for those particular crops. Here is a chart that is about base temperatures, and this is below these specific temperatures, all plant growth stops. And we really don't want our plants to stop growing because it really puts a lot of stress on the plants. Uh, if you're planting plants that are close to these base temperatures and they go into hibernation essentially, and then they start again and then they stop again and start again. There's a lot of stress on your plants. So you really don't want to even approach this. Uh, here's a few examples, peppers and tomatoes. You'll see if the soil temperature gets below 50 degrees, the plant completely stops growing. All plant growth is that. So we really want to wait uh, when we're planning our schedule to make sure that stop growing at that particular point. So one of the key things about, uh, about choosing seeds is the days to maturity. And in our area, the days to maturity Sarah and Dale, you've cut out audio. We've lost you. Here on the back of the packet, we have a 70 days to harvest. Sarah, and could, you, could, yes. you repeat, could you repeat that again? We lost you on video. Go back to the other slide and start again. Oh, go back a slide? Yes, please. Or to the beginning of this one. Can we just talk about this one? I'm not sure I know how to go back. <laughs> no, oh, go yes. ahead. Okay. OK, did you need this slide? No. Okay, so there we go. So we're, now we're talking about choosing your seeds and how important that is for us because we prefer seeds that have a shorter days to maturity because our growing season is considerably shorter than some. If you are living on the east side, however, you might do well to, play, to pick things that have longer maturity. Um, and here's a typical seed packet that says uh, 70 days to harvest, um, and uh, and that would be for sweet peppers. Uh, that's an interesting thing about peppers because uh, peppers have to be transplanted, and we'll talk about that uh, thing. So, um, where do you get seeds that are specific for your area? Well, for our area, 
on this side. Uh, these are some sample uh, seed catalogs from places like Ed Hume, which I'm sure you recognize this black uh, envelope or territorial, but there's also these other ones, Salt Spring and West Coast Seeds and Wild Garden Seeds. Those are interesting uh, places to get seeds. So look around for your area for things that are specific for your growing area, especially if you have a short growing area or growing time like we do. Now, the note about tomatoes and peppers, the days to maturity is actually starts at transplanting for tomatoes. So you start the seed and then you grow it to the point where you can transplant it. And then you start the clock on your days to maturity. So if it says 70 days, that's from the day you put it in the ground. So that's, a, that's an interesting thing. Now, one of the things that people are always asking us is how do we grow a ripe tomato in our area? And uh, we happen to have a talk about that and you can access it. And here's a live link. If you click on this in our presentation, you should be able to jump there or you can just go to our website and find that. So all those tomato questions, we've got that already. And uh, we're mostly talking about seed planting today, not how to get them to the other end. <laughs> okay, so what about transplanting versus direct seeding? Um, a key question you have to ask yourself is, well, should I, should I transplant everything then? Or can I direct seed some things? But the key question is actually, is your garden ready? Because you can't say you're going to go out and transplant or, or plant anything unless you have your garden ready. Uh, and in our area, you can go out in June and it can be a muddy mess. Uh, so one idea is to remember that when you are planning your seed planting schedule, look ahead and make sure your garden is going to be able to be ready when your seeds go in or your transplants go in. So uh, waiting around for the soil to dry can really delay things. So one idea is to uh, get your garden ready earlier, maybe the fall before, and then cover it so it doesn't get all soaked. And then it's ready for planting when you are. So that's a key point. Uh, direct seeding does have some advantages. You only have to plant once, we hope, uh, instead of planting and replanting. Uh, you have don't have to care for those transplants and not fry them in your greenhouse or not let them freeze. Uh, you're not limited by this greenhouse space and it may be less effort to haul things out of your greenhouse to get them out to the garden. Uh, and some plants actually prefer direct seeding. For instance, taproot plants like carrots, uh, they don't they do not like to be transplanted. So uh, you may just have to direct and seed those. Uh, direct seeding does have some disadvantages. You might have problems with uh, things like slugs because you have less control over the conditions than you do in a greenhouse. Uh, you may have less control over the weather because this was April 6th last year and some people were trying to get their garden ready and that was no way that was gonna happen. Your garden season is also more dictated by your actual area, your zone, your, your garden, and you don't have the ability to control the weather in a greenhouse if you're gonna plant outside. So those are some maybe no's. Transplanting, of course, does have some advantages. It extends the season. It lets you grow maturity, uh, longer maturity plants, and you can do the succession planting where you take, uh, you have an area that's grown something, and they're done and you take it out and now you have transplants ready to go and you've been growing them somewhere else and now you can use your outside garden space to get more food out of your smaller pot or plot. Hopefully we have a plot. And it may save you money uh, because you can grow these yourself and then you can, I don't have to keep buying plants from the store. However, it does have a few disadvantages. Uh, you need light and heat which usually requires money and a space of some kind. Uh, you can use a sunny window, but overhead lighting is really, really much better for growing plants. And your space is always limited. No one ever has a big enough uh, greenhouse unless you own this one. <laughs> so uh, that's those are some maybe negatives, but the good news is there's always a way to get around it. You can set up a table with plants on it and get some lights going over it. You can have one of these containers. You can put lights on this 
can get a baker's rack and grow things. The key is to get light on the top and heat underneath. So heat mats are useful too. But lots of people can fit something in their house somewhere and get some transplants going. Okay, let's talk about succession gardening. All right, so succession gardening is a good way to uh, plan ahead and to know what you'll be planting throughout the season. And there's two different ways to think about succession gardening. One is that you have continuous production of your crop throughout the entire season. So you want to plant the same crop several times throughout the season. So you have this continuous production. Examples of this might be radishes that you would plant every 10 days or so. Uh, lettuce, you can start new lettuce uh, every two to three weeks. So you have more of a constant production. Uh, I prefer growing uh, 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 snap peas or snap peas or fresh right. eating peas and you can and you can do succession gardening with those as well if you've got space uh every few weeks the other type of su succession gardening that you have is that you replace what was harvested into the available garden space with something new that you can then harvest later on in the season this requires though that you do the spring plantings and you have early harvest. And that's sort of the key that you'll, you're able to harvest your crop early in the summer. That allows you to have available garden space then for the second crop in the this, in this succession. An example of this might be broccoli, but you need to identify a variety of broccoli that has uh, a short number of days to maturity. So here are two examples that I happen to find. Uh, these are fairly short days to maturity. Broccoli usually is 70 to 75 days, but here are some short varieties. You can use those. And then once the crop is harvested, you can replant these again and get a second crop then in the fall. Something to keep in mind if you're going to do this type of succession gardening is your days to maturity need to be 60 days or less and therefore you can harvest early in the summer and replace those with other plants. So radishes and turnips, 22 days to maturity for radishes, 40 days to maturity for the turnips. Uh, again, you can harvest these. Here we have cauliflower and broccoli. Those are less than 60 days to maturity. Lettuce, spinach, and Swiss chard, uh, all are in the late 20s. You can replace those. Peas, typically, whether you have snap peas or snow peas, 60 days uh, to maturity. And then also if you are growing onions or garlic uh, and you harvest those garlic in July and onions in August, suddenly that space in your garden opens up and you can do some succession garden and put in other crops in that particular space. Personally, uh, I like radishes. Uh, Sarah laughs about that, but we like radishes. So I'll do four plantings in the spring. My first planting around April 1st. Uh, and then I'll uh, harvest that particular crop and be able to plant again five weeks later around May uh, 8th. So those are my days that I generally harvest uh, in uh, early May and then in early June. I'll also have an area that I'll plant radishes in uh, around the uh, April 20th. And then again, I'll harvest that crop and plant again in, in the end of May. These planting schedule then will allow me to harvest almost continuously from late April through the end of June. Even though the days to maturity is 22 days, I can still get a continuous harvest of those. Uh, peas, uh, I generally do four. I have two different locations in my garden where I grow my snow peas. One planting I'll do around April 10th. And then again, I'll pull those vines out and plant in that same location again around the end of June. My harvest time. Your audio has cut out again. Being then during the month of July and then late September into October. I'll wait for this. Yeah. I'll wait till this come back. All right. Um, for broccoli, 
this requires transplants. Uh, and so if you have a short day to maturity, uh, you can do a planting in April and you can be harvesting your broccoli throughout the month of June. Once the plants have uh, produced, you can pull those out and then do a second planting. Therefore, you can get uh, two crops of broccoli in a given year if you have a short days to maturity. Uh, here we have during the month of June and then again during the month of September. Crops like lettuce, turnips, and cauliflower will all be harvested typically by June the 20th. And then that particular part in your garden becomes available for succession gardening. I typically put my bush beans in. They require warmer soil temperatures for germination. Uh, and so I typically wait until almost the end of June. I'm harvesting my beans then from mid-August through early September. Cucumbers also require very warm soil. Uh, for germination and for growth. Again, uh, harvesting from mid-August through mid-September. Uh, With the bush beans, uh, they're typically done producing uh, in early September. So I've got another few weeks then. And so I'll put more radishes in, of <laughs> course. Uh, and I can put some radishes in where the beans were at, not the whole area, but some of it uh, for radishes at that point. With garlic, Typically you're harvesting garlic uh, in uh, mid-July and that bed opens up for you to do uh, more planting. Summer squash, if you have transplants has uh, 50 days to maturity, you can put summer squash in where your garlic bed was and then be harvesting through the uh, month of September into early October. With the onions harvested by August 15th, you've still got a few more weeks. So crops like turnips and lettuce and spinach uh, can be planted in that bed where the onions came out of your crop at that point. One thing that I do with my lettuce uh, is that I will start seeds in pots inside of my greenhouse in late July and have them grow for about three weeks. And then I will transplant my lettuce outside into the main garden in mid-August. And I'll be able to harvest then lettuce throughout the month of September. With the spinach, I'll do a direct seeding in mid-August in the garden, and I'll be able to start harvesting my spinach then in mid-September. What I will tell everybody is I do plant lettuce and spinach in the spring, but my crops that I plant in the fall always are so much better, and they are just better in the fall. My lettuce is better. Uh, my spinach is better. The spinach tends to bolt if I plant it in the spring. The lettuce, when the heat comes on, just doesn't do very well. So I get my best crops of these actually uh, with fall planting. Mm -hmm. This is me. Oh, it's still you. It's still me. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> all right. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about greenhouse gardening as well. Uh, and when to plant. I have successfully planted and grown and harvested all of these crops uh, from inside of my greenhouse. Uh, one advantage that I have is that I have raised beds that are actually inside of my greenhouse. I've got eight of these. Each one is five feet long, uh, four feet long, sorry. And uh, the soil temperature gets really warm early in the spring. And so I'm able to do uh, about six weeks earlier than I am out in my regular garden. Here are some pictures uh, of uh, my greenhouse in the summer growing uh, quite well. And then me sitting in my greenhouse there with uh, my early crops. My cucumbers that I put inside my greenhouse, the uh, soil temperature in there typically is up in the 70s by mid-May. And I can harvest cucumbers six weeks earlier than I can with my direct seeding in late June that I do out in my garden. My beets and carrots, I typically will plant in August inside of my uh, greenhouse. I do not typically get a crop uh, in the fall, uh, but I will overwinter them. And then when it gets warm again in the spring, they'll start growing again and I can do a, a spring harvest. Here's a picture from January of 21. Uh, we had some snow up here. And those are uh, some of the plants that I had growing inside of my greenhouse with the snow on the outside. 
Here are the carrots uh, that we pulled out of the greenhouse uh, from May 26th, harvested our carrot crop. Uh, and those came out of the um, greenhouse about the same time that I was doing direct seeding into my garden of my summer carrot crop. And then I also, uh, here's a picture from Thanksgiving of 2021, uh, where we had bell peppers, green bell peppers and tomatoes uh, from my greenhouse as well. So in summary, uh, I can have cucumbers uh, six weeks earlier uh, by planting them in mid-May for July harvest. My tomatoes and peppers, I do transplants and I'll typically have plants ready to go in August to put in and then I can harvest in the late fall. And then my snow peas, carrots, and beets, I'll typically uh, put those as seeds in August and they'll winter over and then those are good for a uh, spring harvest. Okay, so now some specifics for, gen we can't talk about every plant in the world, but the brassica family includes broccoli, cabbage, cauliflower, kale, and radishes, you'll be happy to know. Um, <laughs> and so how does this apply to specific groups of plants? So if you start the plant as a transplant at the end of March, then you're able to put it out in the garden just about the time that uh, normally you would be direct seeding the plant. So you can see that these group, uh, you start the transplant in March and you can set it out in May but if you're going to direct seed it outside, and, and they generally recommend these are transplanted, but if you do, you're, you are six weeks behind. So if, you're, if you have the ability to make transplants, that gives you a different starting date for your seeds, uh, six weeks earlier. And, uh, and uh, radishes, you can plant direct seed because they are a taproot. Uh, and certainly you will get radishes uh, early enough for anyone <laughs> except for Dale. <laughs> okay, so what are some tips for brassicas? Um, one of the things about broccoli is that a lot of people plant many broccoli all at the same time. And then you end up with a lot of broccoli all in the same week. So you have many heads of broccoli in the week at the end of whatever month it is that they ripen and then you have nothing. So one idea is to start things uh, on our schedule and think, okay, 10 weeks from now or whenever it is, I think I'm gonna eat two heads of broccoli. So you start, you get two heads going. And then the next week you do that again. So starting every few weeks and having various plants at various levels of development uh, is a good idea. And of course, cabbage, cauliflower, kale, I would recommend planting less kale than I did. I planted several rows of kale and it all came ready at the same time. So uh, staggering is a good idea. And don't be like my brother, sorry, Scott. Uh, he plants about 50 radishes all at once and then they just get big and he never eats them. He just likes to grow them. So I would suggest if you're gonna plant radishes to eat, you might wanna space it out like Dale does. Okay, and then there's uh, the, we had to learn how to say this, cucurbits, uh, and these are all those summer squash family plants. Uh, and you can see that starting them as a transplant in mid-April, setting them out in June, as opposed to starting them in June, you get a much, uh, much more successful crop. And uh, also you can control the soil temperature for that seed better if you're transplanting them. However, they do have to say that they don't actually recommend transplanting for these, although a lot of these are for sale in plant sales or in garden stores. You just have to be very, very careful not to disturb those roots as you transplant. And the actual recommendation is to plant them or buy them in a plant pot that can disintegrate in the ground in some way, like a newspaper pot or a peat pot or something like that. And uh, that's that. Okay, tomatoes. Everybody wants to know about tomatoes. Specifically about tomatoes. Um, so the days to maturity, if you look at tomato plants, uh, have a wide range. Uh, I found some that were 50 days. I think I saw one that was 48 days uh, and then go well up to a hundred or more days. But typically your tomato plants have 50 to 90 days uh, to maturity and therefore they must be transplanted. 
and so the question becomes, then when do I start my seeds, right? So if you're planting tomatoes and you're at lower elevation down closer to the river, uh, your soil is gonna warm up uh, a couple weeks earlier than up uh, at higher elevation. So if you have a 50 day tomato, you're planting it on May 21st, you might get your first ripe tomato in mid July. Uh, if you have a 90 day tomato, uh, it'll be into mid August before you get that. Dale, no audio. We lost you. It's going to be into uh, mid August before you get your first ripe tomato. Last year in 2022 at my house, uh, I got my tomatoes in the ground around June 10th, but my the nights up here were still cold. They It was into the 40s every night, every night, every night, every night until almost June the 21st. Uh, and 76 days later after that date, did we finally get our first tomato uh, September the 5th. So watch your soil temperature, watch how that is. I know the calendar is helpful. You're like, oh my gosh, I'm late getting these in, but it really does matter about the soil temperature itself. So when do you need to plant the seeds to have the plants ready to be transplanted at the right time? If you have a heated greenhouse and you can keep your soil temperature warmer, uh, then typically the advice is 50 to 70 days before you do your transplanting is when you put your seeds into the soil. So uh, if you are at uh, lower elevation, you can go 10 days earlier around March 20th. If you are at higher elevation, uh, you can wait then uh, until uh, April 10th and then you still have two months uh, for the seedlings to grow. If you don't have a greenhouse and you just have heat mats and, and it's not as warm and you can't keep your plants as warm, uh, then you want to be planting even earlier than that. Lower elevation, uh, if you live there, you can go as early as March the 1st uh, to plant your uh, seeds. That'll give you your 85 day window then to put plant your uh, plants out around May 21st. If you're at higher elevation, maybe it'll be closer to March 17th uh, before you start planting your seeds for transplant. With tomatoes, keep in mind that the seedlings must be up potted. So we start with uh, the small seedlings and you see the first true leaves that come out. Those uh, can be then transplanted into slightly larger pots. And then when those out are outgrown, uh, you can put them up into gallon pots and those will be ready then when you set them outside uh, for the growing season. And then hopefully at the end of the growing season, after all that work and all that effort, uh, we can have a bountiful crop of tomatoes uh, that comes along. Okay, well, what if you, uh, maybe you've never tried this, maybe you have. Uh, there is something called wintering, winter gardening. And basically this requires knowledge of your microclimate, your site, your soils, all the varieties that work well in the winter um, and how you might protect your plants. Uh, but here is, here's a, a little bit about that. Um, there's a really good resource called Winter Vegetable Production for Small Farms and Gardens, west of the Cascades. This is in our resource uh, list at the end of this slideshow. And I think you can just link to it uh, from there. But it's very, very uh, nice resource and it was put out by Oregon State. Okay, so let's say you wanted to try planting stuff earlier and having it grow through the winter. Uh, first of all, you have to choose plants that work well in this situation. They tend to be in the Nebraska family. Um, so you would have something in the ground in uh, August or July or even into September, and then you hold it in the ground and, and then you harvest it as long as it hasn't frozen. So here's a typical one. You have broccoli, you get it going in the garden in late July, August, uh, and then you can be harvesting that from February through April. Uh, and of course, if we get an unusually hard freeze, you have to do some covering or controlling of the environment out in the garden. 
Um, an interesting one is garlic. You actually plant it uh, in September up to November, and then it grows all winter and you harvest it the next summer. So that's a lovely thing there. And um, that's about, that's the basic concept. Most of these, they grow, do their growing in the summer and the fall, and then they tend to hold, and then you're just harvesting them. They're not usually, I mean, they do a little growing. Um, carrots, if you get them in the ground and you keep them in the ground until they're cold, not freezing, uh, if they experience some cold weather, they get sweeter in the ground and they are much better. I've kept them in the ground all winter, that works. I've uh, pulled them out and stored them in dry dirt in like a big container with layers of dirt and carrots that none of them touch. That works fantastic. Uh, you take the tops off. And I've done kind of a combination. In my garden, if I leave them all winter, they get a fireworm in them and it's a little drilled hole and they tend to rot. So that's very disappointing when you're pulling only a third of a carrot out and it's all slimy under there. So um, I generally try to keep them a little bit into the colder weather and then I harvest them and take the tops off and put them in the dirt. Okay, key point. So one thing that always helps when you're planning is to plan ahead and keep a logbook, a journal, and a planting calendar. And you want to record the day that you plant. I always keep record too of the soil temperature. Uh, when I put it in, keep extensive notes uh, so that you can refer to it then the following year. You do want to record not only your successful gardening, but also your failures. I have failures all the time, but I want to remember and hopefully not make that same mistake another year or learn from that uh, and, and try something different than the following year. I also keep notes in my logbook about recommendations for the next season. Try this, see what happens, think about doing this or try a different variety. This variety of broccoli didn't grow well, try something different again next year. So I always have those recommendations uh, for that. So in summary, we covered uh, several things today. Uh, growing zones, know your growing zones and, and keep track of that. Look at your seed packets, know your days to maturity, direct planting or uh, transplants, know which is better for your particular plant. Some ideas about succession planting, extending the growing season. We talked both about in the garden and if you happen to have a greenhouse, how to utilize that. Some specific examples we talked about, brassicas, uh, cucurbits, cucurbit. cucurbits, <laughs> yes. cucurbits and tomatoes. Uh, we talked about winter gardening. And then here is our resources uh, that you can uh, access. We have uh, this page and that page as well. So we have two pages and then we have questions.